Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This podcast is about the public law principle of acting rationally. I'm sure we all like to think that we act rationally, but this is such a big subject in terms of public law principle that we divide it into two. Part one of how to act rationally is going to be all about having an evidence basis, actually addressing the evidence and forming a defensible reaction to the evidence and having reasons that that like hang together. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to just spend the time on the cases in which social workers have bothered to do that and have been largely upheld for having tried hard enough. It doesn't mean to say that they have uh, pleased the clientele. It doesn't mean to say that the clientele got what they wanted, but still the local authorities who bothered to train their staff to act rationally and to be articulate about why their reasons were defensible, those are the ones who have tended to win cases over the past 10 years. So on my list here, I have got Oxfordshire and Cambridgeshire, I've got Kensington and Chelsea, Hackney, Lewisham, and two instances of Southwark. I don't mean to tell you that they've all won cases, but sometimes they have lost them when they really shouldn't have done, or sometimes they've won them where I think that they were lucky to get away with it. I'm going to be explaining it, though, all in terms of what it means to act rationally. So um, this will be useful to people, and I hope that you appreciate that the the links to these cases are further on in the PowerPoint. We've got the Oxfordshire case involving Luke Davy, where the evidence was that the family staff that he was employing on his direct payment weren't about to resign just because his budget was going to be cut and he was going to have fewer hours or uh, have to pay them less. There was no evidence that they were about to resign. In fact, there was evidence the other way because they'd said that they were going to resign and then they withdrew their resignation. There's the Hackney case where the evidence was that a man with dire problems was coping with daily living, even though he clearly wasn't doing so very well and anybody would have felt sorry for it. Then there's the Lewisham case where offering pads to somebody with muscular dystrophy instead of nighttime care was unacceptable at a level of policy, but okay on the actual evidence involved in an individual's um, ter- interminable reassessment. And then there's the Southwark case, the one involving a Mr. Aburas, where the contention was by the council that the man had no needs for anything remotely within the concept of care or support and that was upheld by the judge not just as a rational approach to the evidence but as to the judge's own view of the evidence um, as if the judge was sitting there as an appeal judge and that was legitimate on the part of the judge because the judge was um, considering a human rights issue. And then even before the CARE Act, there were cases like the famous Elaine McDonald's incontinence pads case, and another Southwark case going back to the 90s called Karna, and Cambridge's case involving a gentleman called KM. So those are all cases where doing the right thing has worked or nearly worked to uphold um, a judgment. And then down below, there are cases where not sticking to this principle regarding the need for a rationale has been devastating to the authority. We've already mentioned in these sessions, I think, the Merton case on reassessment, where there was no addressing the evidence or the concerns of the parents and therefore Merton's decisions were quashed. Then there's Redbridge, the Ali Raja case, 
in where, the, it, where there appears to have been an apparently deliberate avoidance of the need to address the issues, a kind of corporate um, set of blinkers. There's a case involving Westminster where the suggestions for what was good enough were literally bizarre and beyond what was tolerable in a civilised society in that day and age, I don't know about now. Another Southwark case where the social worker appeared to do a conscientious job and you go through the case thinking, well, the judge is going to say, yep, that was good enough. But ultimately, the judge found omissions based on attention to the evidence, which meant that Southwark lost. And the Sutton case I've already mentioned, where the man was offered three nights of waking staff money because the medical evidence suggested that he had three nights of fits per month, but not a clue as to how any provider would be able to tell which nights those unpredictable fits were going to occur on. So that's a case where the suggestions for what would be good enough were laughably obtuse. And then Birmingham, where the person's evidence of deterioration was ignored in favour of the maths, and a 12-hour package was cut to six hours a day involving... Uh, two workers, whereas before there had been only one. The maths worked out the same, but it did not slide under the radar of the court because, of course, 12 is twice what 6 is, and 6 means that there would be whole lengthy gaps during the day where the individual would have nobody. Excuse me for a moment. <sighs> Excuse me, I have to do this. Sure, this has happened to everybody who works at home. So basically, um, I'm pointing out that it isn't just a principle that is for theory. It's a principle that is for good practice and for avoiding the time wasting that a judicial review involves. In the Cambridgeshire case, the gap between what the gentleman and his mother wanted and uh, what the local authority was prepared to give him was the difference between 85,000 and 120 or even more thousand pounds. This case went to the Supreme Court and ultimately Cambridgeshire won. The Court of Appeal had given the victory to Cambridgeshire as well. But it was one of those Pyrrhic victories because en route to saying, all right, then, you just about squeak through. The judges explained what um, Cambridgeshire had done that had been stupid. For instance, they had appointed an independent social worker and then agreed with the independent social worker as to what the needs were, but then disagreed with the independent social worker as to what would meet the need. And in fact, when you looked at what the independent social worker had said, the independent social worker had just allowed himself to be the mouthpiece of the mother. The argument there was about whether the mother would or would not continue to meet some of the needs. And it was very clear that she wanted to stop. But the forms that the social worker needed to fill out had to come off the fence about whether she was or was not doing the care that she was doing. So because she wanted to stop, she put down that she wasn't doing it, and then she was seen or treated as if she was lying. And that is a really ridiculous way of looking at what the old law involved. This is not a Care Act case, but this is in the past. This is in 2012. The young man argued uh, through his barristers that the offer of £85,000 was irrational. And it was largely because they didn't like the use of the resource allocation system. Cambridgeshire had got a RAS 
a computer-based guesstimate of what it would cost to provide care, but they had an upper band calculator too for special needs. And during negotiations, they had added an extra two or four pounds per hour to the, the rate that they were willing to pay. Cambridgeshire did everything wrong, but still won the case because the process of getting to the final hearing extracted all of the reasons out of Cambridgeshire that they should have been able to give first time off. The judge said it was rational for Cambridgeshire to use the RAS, provided that they checked and cross-checked the result in relation to the individual. And the judge said this, so this was a Pyrrhic victory because RASs were fashionable at the time. You can have a RAS, but crucial to a RAS is, ooh, ouch, a realistic nexus both between the needs and the points and between the points and the costs. The framework in uh, Cambridgeshire for the resource allocation system had been worked up from 260 people who had direct payments. So it was an average of what different types of people with different amounts of need tended to cost the authority. And that gave the, ju the judge the chance to say this, the sum identified by a RAS is not the product of a direct individual costing. And for that reason, the use of a RAS is only the first step in a local authority's search for the answer to the question posed at the fourth stage of the community care journey, which is how much should this cost us? The figure generated by the framework, which did have a maximum, was then adjusted upwards by reference to the upper banding calculator. And yes, this does make it look as if cost was the be all and end all, but in fact, by the end of the case, given that the authority had never thought it, had never thought that the man needed all of the things claimed at the cost claimed for them, it was scarcely surprising that they considered that the total offered by them was more than sufficient for this purpose. So the court said this, this court cannot conclude that that decision is irrational. And however confusing the explanations have been, the family and the court do now have an explanation which makes sense. That's all it's got to do. So I thought that we could revise too the McDonald Pads case because this was a case where a lady with a neurogenic bladder, meaning she needed to urinate three times a night, had been given a nighttime assistance who was then taken away. The assistant had helped her access a commode on the nights when she needed that help. And that was then taken away and she was left with NHS provided incontinence pads. The local authority had learned from some of the other cases and they stressed the positive of this. Greater safety, independence and privacy, as well as managing to save £22,000 a year for other people from Kensington and Chelsea. Miss MacDonald considered this to be an intolerable affront to her dignity, and the majority of the Supreme Court agreed ultimately, although they were very sorry for her, and they knew how ghastly it would have to be effectively to be left to wet yourself, they said that this was not an unlawful approach, nor a breach of her human rights, nor a breach of the discrimination legislation. The one female judge dissented and was absolutely disgusted at the direction of travel. She actually said something along the lines of, this is a very unpleasant thin edge of a very unpleasant wedge, because in 10 years' time, if we carry on down this route, we'll all be lying in our own feces. This may be a case about urine, but it could equally be a case about feces. And ultimately, standards will change as this society gets more desperate. So we need to stop this now. But the other judges did not agree with her. And they said that what she had done was mix up 
the concept of what a need is with the service that is considered to be appropriate to respond to it. And that should be meaningful for those of you who understand the CARE Act, because the concept of assessment has now been cut away from care planning and just focuses on the deficit. Although you do it in an asset and strengths based way, if you are a local authority social worker. So the assessment is to identify the things that the individual does not have and cannot achieve and the impact of all of that. And the planning is to concentrate on the appropriate service response. So uh, needing help to mobilize at night is one way of expressing a need. But if you call the need a toileting need, then you give yourself the option to provide a far wider range of semi-appropriate responses. The man who gave evidence in the McDonald case was Tom Brown, and he had been involved in other bits of litigation elsewhere. He learnt, and he learnt to say this, the use of pads for patients who are not clinically incontinent is widespread and accepted practice in the provision of social services and is general practice as a means of ensuring safety in patients and residents with severely compromised mobility um, across the NHS as well as the local authority world. The fact that the client may have no alternative but to accept the accepted practice does not mean that to adopt the uh, general practice against the wishes of the client is irrational. And if it is not irrational in this special sense of the word, it is not unlawful. And that's how Elaine MacDonald came to lose her case. Now, a case of which the local authority won was the Care Act Cuts case uh, known as Davy. This gentleman was reassessed and planned for on the footing that he could safely spend more time alone without the benefit of a paid for PA always being present. It was also considered that he could and should reduce the amount he was choosing to pay his PAs, who were largely members of his own family. And as to the rate that needed to be paid, there was no evidence that his carers would leave if their salary was put down. They had withdrawn their resignations. The minimum wage was 7.20 at the time. The £40 night shift rate that was being offered was compatible, as far as the evidence was concerned, with many other service users, uh, what they were paying at the time. The care planning time for Mr. Davy being left on his own was only phased in and increased gradually. Instead of mincing towards meanness, as I shall call it, the council um, sensibly did not make a great big leap and cut it immediately, but they transitioned it in and they sucked it to see what would happen. In other words, they tried and they worked with the client. And the client um, was told that the extra specially important reason to give it a go was that the council could see that he was losing his independence and autonomy because of his dependency on his support network. Now, that isn't meant to be offensive to anybody. It's just a, It's just in the nature of what happens. We all know how when we find somebody who can sort the car out, we become very passive. Um, likely, too, we feel the same way about people who will empty the rubbish for us. We just accept that they like doing it. So um, there was an argument about whether the council was really driven by the funding, and they managed to explain that it was just chance that as the uh, hours went down and the rates went down, um, uh, it was all going to cost the same anyway. They just managed to uh, keep that all within the initial planned limits. But that was just chance. And the key thing was that 
a social worker who'd been at it for 26 years gave very coherent evidence that changes in the claimant's current care team would actually be positive for the claimant and his emotional well-being because it would reduce his dependence upon specific carers. And yes, it might be unsettling in the short term, but in the long term, it would be great. And um, in with all credit to Mr. Davy, when he was asked how he was coping with it, he said that uh, the social worker was not wrong. And therefore, the judge was slightly uncomfortable about the idea of the whole team breaking up. But he said, in fact, if there is no evidence that they are breaking up, I don't need to worry about that. And these cases are um, brought in front of really competent public law judges. So David Bean, in this case, is um, an infamously good public lawyer. And I could never disagree with this case because on the evidence, um, it was right that Oxfordshire won. This is an interesting case, which we won't go completely through, but I want you to notice that it's an involving Southwark and a social worker here called Mr Chowdhury. And Mr Chowdhury is mentioned in practically every paragraph because in the case, Mr Chowdhury considered this and decided that, took account of this, gave consideration to countervailing uh, issues, and the whole of the case revs up to giving the impression that Mr Chowdhury did a hugely careful job. Uh, the second slide goes on to explain that uh, he had reasons for everything on which he disagreed with the family, and um, that when he mentioned the horror of £50,000 a year for a nighttime carer for this gentleman, um, he wasn't um, without reason to be shocked at that. The person had been described as an insomniac, uh, and Mr Chowdhury decided that he had an erratic sleep pattern. But he was still unfortunate enough to mention the £50,000 a year. So I'm conveying the impression of Mr Chowdhury doing a conscientious and creditable job as a social worker who's not a lawyer. And you would think that the result was that Southwark uh, won the case. But in fact, they lost this case just. So the judge went through everything, said what a good job Mr Chowdhury had done, but then found something wrong in a public law sense, with the rationality of Mr Chowdhury's judgments. And therefore, ultimately, on uh, the management plan, nighttime care and occupational therapy, Mr Chowdhury was criticised as having made material mistakes in terms of public law. The judge uh, particularly found this, and I think that we would all have to agree with this. It was unlawful to decide that JG was eligible for two to one care for only two hours per day. The claimant suffered from urinary and faecal incontinence. She required to be showered not only at regular times in the morning, but at unpredictable times in the day and night. As is argued, that need is not able to be answered by provision limited to two hours a day. Given the acceptance of the need in this regard, in other words, the problem, unpredictable self-soiling, limiting this to two hours a day is irrational, and this element of the decision is materially flawed. At the end, the judge said, I have no doubt that Mr Chowdhury carried out a con conscientious evaluation of the circumstances but there were material pieces of evidence which he did not take into account in coming to the conclusions that he did. And the assessment, therefore, is, as a consequence, unlawful. So even though he'd done a good job on maybe eight out of ten points, two out of ten points were killer points. Hackney is a case that we've looked at during this series already. It's a case on eligibility. It's a case where a person was found to lack eligibility because they were coping without sustaining significant impact. 
And it was a case where the real essence of the man's problem was his housing situation, not because of his physical or his mental impairment. In this case, there had been a difficult series of assessments because he didn't speak he didn't speak perfect English, but everybody had used simple language and he had been honest about his difficulties and he had been honest about his coping skills because no doubt he was treated to assets and strengths based approaches. And then those very coping skills that he'd given evidence of were used to decide that he was not a person with care and support needs, um, not ones that were eligible anyway. Hackney defended its position and the judge stressed that social workers are not supposed to be lawyers. In, save in a case where it is obvious that a public body has acted perversely, the duty of the court is to leave the decisions to the very public body that Parliament has entrusted the decision to. And the judge said there was no basis for stigmatising as irrational the conclusion that an independent advocate was not required or that Hackney staff had reached any decision that was not properly open to them. The judge said that the principal issues must be considered, the correct legal questions asked and answered, and a conclusion reached that is within the broad margin of discretion afforded to the assessor. And because I'm a public lawyer first and foremost, I cannot disagree with the judge on his statement of the law. And that means that whenever advisors tell people that they would struggle to win, they're doing them a favour. It's not that they're not shouting loud enough or on their side. They're saving the person the struggle of a case that isn't going to get off uh, the ground. This next Southwark case, representing another win for a council, is a case where the social worker was a man called Mr Bonzi. And the judge, who is one of our foremost public lawyers, said, I've asked myself whether there is material whose nature, viewed objectively, gives me a convincing basis for rejecting Mr Bonzi's views about this client. I have found none. The judge went on to say that if I was to conclude that this person had such a pressing need uh, for social worker support that they needed accommodation so as to get that support, then I would be going over the line. It would be me as the judge substituting a conclusion for that of Mr Bonzi without the support of any professional judgment to contradict him and without the backing of any clear objective evidence supporting a view in relation to that. The evidence just doesn't come up to that standard, he said. I cannot disagree with Mr Bonzi. And that is in spite of this man being a man who, because of his homelessness, was not receiving support from a local mental health team and a man who remained at significant risk of deterioration of his mental state. So you need to understand that this case was about the man's asylum-seeking status overall, and that we're not saying that people who are mentally unwell and at risk of deterioration don't qualify for uh, the CARE Act. The judge said this, the highest it can be put is that these materials would support the view that this man may be destitute. He may need support and subsistence, depending on what other support is available to him. But the place he's supposed to go for that, given his asylum status, is the Home Secretary. The evidence does not support a conclusion that there is any looked after need for social worker support that requires the provision of accommodation. And ultimately, therefore, um, he doesn't need support to take his medication or to access and consume food. He doesn't need to be in a building in order for him to be able to cope. 
And so uh, that was a case which Southwark won, which is of great importance to people um, who do asylum seeking work. This case involving Lewisham is another incontinence pads case. And it was a case that was won by the council. And I think it's the one that I have the biggest difficulty with. I think it really shouldn't have been won. But the client in this case um, uh, was someone who had um, let things slide for a very, very, very long time. She had a package at one stage of 104 hours a week, and it was ultimately cut to 40 hours, and the council still won. So you would obviously be asking, well, how could the council win? Well, in the italics here, it kind of gets around to explaining that the council won because of its own its own failure to carry on and do what it should have done at the right time. Um, after it provided a hoist for this lady, it failed to review the care package. So the hours stayed up, even though a hoist had been uh, provided, which cut out one of the whole needs for a spare worker. And uh, when they finally got round to cutting the package, uh, they did another plan uh, and they ultimately then they cut it to 52 hours. They halved it, but they ultimately didn't even then implement that cut. So this lady basically had care for five years during a time when Lewisham was saying that it had a good reason for thinking she didn't need nearly as much. So as you go through this really long case on this blue link here, you can't tell which way it's going to go. But you do see that the claimant's barristers were taking the line that succeeded in Merton, that the eventual assessment efforts on the part of Lewisham were unlawful for reasons of not thinking about this, that, this, that, or the other. And the judge took all of that on board and gave Lewisham the benefit of the doubt by saying, even though there are some bits of this assessment that just make it look like they copied the old assessments and took it all as read, just because they took shortcuts, it looks like they use shortcuts, the judge said, I'm still satisfied that they did a good enough job. And the judge repeated the edict in previous cases, including the McDonald case. It should not be overlooked that assessments and review documents are documents drafted by social workers, not by lawyers, and nor should they be. They should be construed in a practical way against the factual background in which they're written and with the aim of seeking to discover the substance of their true meaning. So you can't tell me that the courts do not give local authorities the full legitimate scope for their professional judgment that Parliament has intended them to have. There are plenty of cases that show that if you do it the right way, your decision and your evidence can be the thing that saves the local authority from judicial review rather than lands it in hot water. The judge said the case law warns against overzealous textual analysis and indicates that a social worker's assessment should be construed in a practical way. I consider that the decision maker has not simply adopted the old decisions, but has had real regard to all the current circumstances. And ultimately, there were a lot of good reasons for the care no longer being needed. There was upgrading the wheelchair. There was provision and replacement of a mattress. There was uh, the value of the district nurse's evidence as to what a specialist mattress could do. And there was lack of evidence that pain management issues were related to whether there was or was not waking night care. So ultimately, viewing the assessment as a whole, it's not possible to conclude that the approach has been irrational or that the defendant counsel has failed to have regard to the prescribed factors 
including the claimant's individual well-being. So whereas Merton lost, um, this council won um, in similar situations and in a similar era. So that is the material for today. And remember, next week, we're going to be looking at cases where local authorities have taken leave of their senses rather than being found to be irrational because they have failed to take account of all relevant considerations or they have allowed themselves to take account of irrelevant considerations. Next week, we're going to be looking at the cases where councils have literally taken leave of their senses. Doesn't mean that uh, they're uh, no longer able to practice as social workers. It doesn't mean that it is the end of their uh, professional promotion prospects. But it does mean that judicial review quashes the decisions. And does anybody in this session have a question that they would like to ask? Very happy because we've got a bit more time. Does anybody like to unmute and ask a question about rationality? You can see about 30 people in the session, so um, I'm optimistic that somebody would, but I can't make people ask questions. You can put one in the chat if you wanted to. I'm just checking that there are none in the chat. Anybody want to ask one? I appreciate that people are giving up their lunch times to do this. Go for it, Madeline. You're just in time. What did you want to ask? Can you unmute? I probably need to let you. Hang on one second. I probably need to let you. Okay, I think you can unmute now. Hi. Yeah, hi. It's not Madeline. It's uh, Madeline's other half. Probably Hello. better, I would Hello. imagine. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, okay. So um, that, that was a, really, really useful, especially when composing cases and arguments for services that either should be there or could potentially be assessed as being taken away. This whole rational, irrational thing is, I think that's the bit I'm really trying to get my head around at the moment. Mm. Um, is it a, a reasonable argument then uh, before it goes to court and we're still oh, mad? Yeah, I had the doorbell. You've got the phone. Yeah. <laughs> can you just, yeah, it's come up on here as well. Can you still hear me? Sorry. Uh, I can Linda. still hear you, but you need to ask yeah. the question again, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Right. So the question is, is before it gets to any court or any judicial review, etc., is it a reasonable situation for, you know, the, um, the people who are asking for the support or defending the support can actually say to the council, you really do need to give me your rational statements around your position? Yeah. Yeah, let me just I'll show you something useful, if I may. If I can uh, do uh, a new share, let me see if I can get this up. I'm going to stop sharing that, and I'm going to show you um, a PowerPoint that I just did for somebody else this morning, which I believe is going to help. So if I put that down, I'll add these slides to the PowerPoint before I hand it around. And I will show you my red flags for um, conversations that people have with um, local authorities. OK, so hang on a second. Here we go. Can you see if I hang on, if I share that, uh, can you see that? Yes. 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 Okay. So this PowerPoint is a completely separate one, but it is a PowerPoint that I have given to a local authority to try to convey to them when they should be spotting that somebody is having a go at them to convey public law concerns. Are you with me? Because you yep. were talking about how would you express it and what should you really say? So let us look at these. Your staff haven't engaged with anything I've said. All right. That's a flag that nobody has actually addressed what the person thinks is the main point. The person may be wrong about what they think the main point is, but still, if nobody is talking to them, no wonder they are very frustrated. Are you with me? You told me that your council never allows a person to claim, say, disability-related expenditure for X, Y or Z, but my neighbour has showed me their financial assessment. 
And that's an allegation that the staff are either ignorant of the policy or were lying or not bothering to check or treating different people differently. So that's not an unreasonableness uh, claim, but some of the others are. You've refused to let me make my point by shutting me out of meetings or by not giving me time to reply properly or by keeping a staff member on the job who's already fallen out with me. I think you'll probably, if you've been doing these courses, you will have grasped that that's an allegation of a kind of lack of fairness or a failure to involve or bias or conflict of interest. OK, and then... <laughs> The word in the act is X or Y or Z, and your interpretation of it is so extremely wide of that mark, I can't believe you've even taken legal advice. Now, that's coming back to an irrationality argument, because it could be that some words in a statute are really matters of law, which a judge says Parliament must have intended this to mean X, Y or Z. But equally... There are some very woolly words like significant or necessary in the Care Act where a good judge will say Parliament has intended the local authority to have a margin of appreciation. But still, if a local authority says that black means white, um, they're not even saying black could include dark grey. Then in that situation, the judge will just say it's indefensibly out of line. And that's an irrationality argument mixed up with an error of law argument. The Act says that you must do X, Y or Z, but am I understanding you right? You're telling me you won't. Well, that is an allegation that the uh, local authority is ignoring its duties and its duties will either be in the Act or in the regulations. And even if it says it in the guidance, it's supposed to be followed unless there's a very good reason not to. And I've just got one more page of these. Your inaction has cost me money or meant that I had to step up to do what you were clearly obliged to do. That's a claim for that sexy remedy called restitution, reimbursement so that the person at least, even if they are mentally and physically damaged, they at least get what they have spent, which they shouldn't have had to have spent. Are you with me? Yeah, got it. Yeah. Your work Would that apply are... to DRE as well? I mean, in a DRE situation where. Uh, it, it could do, yes. Because yeah. if the DRE was money spent on something that the council should have been providing in the care package and mm. it should never have been left to be DRE and the person was given no choice about it, yes, I'll be offering you a job by the end of this podcast. That will be uh, quick off the op uh, quick, quick on the uptake, that was. Okay. How about this one? Your worker is literally not fit for the job. He's not autism aware. He's not knowledgeable about X, Y or Z and he can't speak English properly. Councils are the judges of competence, but they do have to look at the facts. There comes a point where the tea lady or the post boy cannot be put up to do a Care Act assessment. And that is no disrespect to the jobs of work that they do do. I know you can have a policy about this, but your policy overlooks that its effect basically ignores the wider context of the legislation or the scheme. So this is about having an apparently sensible policy which completely undermines some aspect of the Care Act. Um, and that would most likely be in the context of direct payments or choice of accommodation. I know you can take a while but taking this long is literally unbelievable. And this is the argument that a council has ignored obviously important considerations regarding urgency or has taken unconscionably long. Very typical in COVID that people who were self-funding in um, care homes were just left to carry on spending their own money because they were tucked up and supposedly safe. Um, and they went, didn't go down to £14,250, they went down to zilch, um, if they were lucky enough to survive. Your staff told me it's all been decided in advance. That is an allegation that it has been predetermined and that discretion has been fettered. And then lastly, 
your staff promised me that they would do such and such. Because in that scenario, even though they didn't need to promise, they did promise. And the law says that they should be particularly hard on themselves before departing from a promise that they didn't even need to make. So those are um, instances in human English language of how people present their public law claims. And an irrationality one will be, there. I'm going to add it to the sheet before I send it, there are literally no reasons that we can see justifying your conclusions. And that's how you would put it over. All right. Thank you, Belinda. Okay. That really so, helps. Yeah. Thank you very much for asking that. That was great. And it helps me add a set of slides too. Did anybody else want to ask another one before we finish? We are at two o'clock and we do try to go back to work at that time. All right, then. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, and I'll put the recording out as quickly as I can. Thank you. Bye.